right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2018 COL Financial Market Outlook. My name is Ed Martinez, and I'll be your host for today. Kamusta po tayo ngayong umaga? Okay naman? All right. So, of course, uh, we uh, identify ourselves as the champion for the Filipino investor. And the internet has been a huge part of our business model. In fact, as far as um, September 2017, we have grown to 220,000 customers. Yes, congratulations. Dami na tayo. All right. And of course, the internet is also helping us today because we are live in Facebook. So if you have friends or family who wants to join us this morning and hear the latest from our internal and our guest speaker, uh, please uh, do use the hashtag COL Outlook. They can search in Facebook, hashtag COL Outlook, so they will find the live stream. Uh, you can also like and visit our page in www.facebook.com slash COL Financial. So again, we'd like to thank our friends from PLDT for providing the internet connection for this streaming service. All right, so uh, exciting bang 2018 so far, guys? Medyo, no? Uh, first couple of days, we saw the market really become very exciting, right? And just a few months ago, we were about, a bit worried about the tax reform, but now it's actually a law, right? It's now in force and effect as we speak. A few months ago, when we were talking about the market at 9,000 level, medyo may konting napapangiti. But now, we're already flirting with that level, uh, almost trying to knock on heaven's door. And I go, I go, personally, as a, an investor, I feel that there is something great that's going to happen in 2018. Do you also feel it too, guys? Na feel nyo ba? Medyo, no? I, we, I believe that 2018 will be profitable. All right? And we want to do precisely that. We want to, of course, share our experts with you and our guest speaker to make sure that 2018 is indeed profitable for every one of us. So, let's get the ball rolling. Let me introduce to you our president and CEO, Mr. Dino Bate. Okay, good morning to your customers, friends, and for those of you who are listening to us at, uh, via live streaming in Facebook, welcome to COL's Market Outlook for 2018. I guess you all know the purpose of this briefing. This briefing has really been made for you to make sure that you can make well-informed information, to sift through the noise that we're hearing, and at the same time focus on what matters in our investments. Uh, you know that the market's been up about 10% with less than maybe slightly over a month. And uh, this is, of course, following the trends globally. But probably most of us are asking ourselves, how long will this rally last? And whether we should be buying or selling in this market. Today, we have our usual uh, experts, April and Juanes, who will walk you through the investment process and also help you discuss the different uh, macro factors or fundamental and technical analysis, as well as how you can better manage your portfolios. Uh, aside from April and Juanes, we also like to invite outside experts that can you know, give us some kind of insights or information to give us a better understanding of the things that are happening around us. So today, we've invited Richard Hayderan, who is a highly sought after political analyst and a columnist. He will give us his view about the President Duterte and his foreign policies and how will it impact our country today. And before we move on to the outlook, I'd also like to take this opportunity to give you some updates about what you can look forward to in 2018. As you all know, here in COL, we always try to find ways to make things you know, interesting or try to improve the experience of our customers. So we've come up with a few initiatives that we were looking at to do this year. Let me run through some of them. First is we want to have more interaction and engagement with our customers to better address their needs. For example, like today's event, like a major event like this, we'd like to now put it in Facebook Live. 
not only because we want a wider reach, but also to provide a more uh, transparent distribution of our information and be able to give easy access to our growing customer base. Second, we will relaunch, although I'm not, uh, you know, we've started to talk about this already now, our research platform and make sure that we're able to give you timely and um, um, easy access to the information that our resident analysts and experts will be giving in terms of their views and recommendations in the market. You can now expect that we will try to use different channels or the digital channels to do so, so that you guys can have uh, you know, access wherever you are and how way you want to. And lastly, our mutual fund business. We want to be able to make it simpler for you guys to use mutual funds and how to integrate it in your portfolio. We were just discussing today that the markets are sometimes so difficult today that even the most expensive issues start moving. So maybe you should look at indexing in terms of managing your portfolio. Part of it should be in the index fund to be able to take advantage of all these opportunities that are happening today. But I've asked Marvin to also make sure that to also try to teach you how to use mutual funds to try to manage your risk and your profits. Again, this does not end here. We continue, the team in CEO will continue to look, challenge ourselves to try to find ways to better improve your investment experience with COL. And it's our um, commitment to you guys that we will continue to help you make it easier to manage your portfolio and take control of your financial future. Thank you. Have a good day and uh, enjoy today's briefing. To formally introduce our guest speaker, he is an academic, <coughs> excuse me, a columnist, an author, and having taught political science in Ateneo de Manila University as well as De La Salle University. He's a regular contributor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. He has written for or was interviewed by the world's leading news outlets, which includes Al Jazeera English. BBC, Bloomberg, The New York Times, The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, South China Morning Post, and The Economist. In 2016, he was awarded as the 10 Outstanding Young Men for his contributions in social sciences. In addition to this, he has advised various administrations, government agencies, cabinet secretaries, presidential campaigns, and global hedge funds and other credit rating agencies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you this morning our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Haydarian. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much, Ed, for that uh, introduction. I hope it didn't cut too much into my time. I don't have so much time. I have around 15 to 20 minutes uh, for this very complicated presentation. When I first got the invitation from Dino and the folks for called Financial, I was wondering why am I invited to a financial literacy kind of forum, and I thought maybe it's because I'm an Ilohano, and us, you know, Ilohano stinginess and financial literacy is kind of in our blood. Uh, but kidding aside, I was very glad to give this presentation to this uh, crowd because I felt I can learn a lot from you guys. And of, of course, I mean, I've been around, what, 20 countries in the past month trying to explain President Duterte's foreign policy to the world, not necessarily doing damage control, but just explaining what's happening in this country. Uh, so I felt now at least there's an opportunity to give a kind of a teaser or a taste of the kind of presentations I'm gi giving around the world. Uh, so today I was asked to give an overview, a big picture view of where the Philippines is in terms of its relationships and predisposition uh, towards great powers, particularly the United States, but increasingly China, and what could be the implication of that for the Philippine e economics. So in short, what is the geoeconomics of uh, Duterte's foreign policy? So very quickly, or quite controversially, I described President Duterte as uh, the Filipino Gorbachev. As you know, Gorbachev was the final leader of the Soviet Union. He opened up the country and completely redirected Soviet Union's foreign policy uh, from an antagonistic anti-Western power into a much more pro-Western uh, country. 
Uh, in the case of the Philippines, of course, something that we're moving in the opposite direction. We can argue about that. But the fact of the matter is that President Duterte has been quite revolutionary in terms of our foreign policy. Not revolutionary in the sense of dumping one partner for the other, in this case, US for China, but as someone who has actually recalibrated how we relate to major powers around the world, and particularly China. Now, for you to be a Gorbachev, there should be two conditions or preconditions that have to be uh, uh, fulfilled. One precondition is that your strategy in the past, or however, or the way your country was relating to the world in the past, is no longer the best way forward. In short, there's a new strategic environment that requires a new strategic approach. And the second thing is that if you change your strategic approach towards great powers or, or the world, the cost of that should be outweighed by the benefits. Now, this sounds very abstract to you guys, but I'll try to explain that more uh, later on. In short, what I'm saying here is that President Duterte realized, and a lot of his supporters also realized, that the way the Philippines was relating to US and China in the past administrations, in short, was not sustainable, and, that, and if we change that predisposition, the benefits of that will outweigh the costs. Now, in my opinion, there are five drivers of President's foreign policy. The first one was when he ran for the presidency, it was very clear for President Duterte and those who paid attention to him that he wanted a wholesale rejection of what he felt were the American leaning elite in the Philippines. He felt that the previous presidents were too deferential to foreign powers and the Philippines has to act more independently. The second thing is, of course, President Duterte has been able uh, to recalibrate the Philippine foreign policy because he also has been able to concentrate power so much. As we know, within two months, uh, the PDP Laban went from three people to a 300 uh, super majority in the Congress. President Duterte will be appointing 12 out of 16 members of the Supreme Court. He has had one of the highest approval ratings of any democratically elected president in human history. And actually, his approval rating in the last quarter was higher than when he started. So this amount of political capital gives President Duterte tremendous amount of leeway to recalibrate the Philippine foreign policy more than any of his predecessors in our memory. The third factor is the United United States has been an ambivalent partner, particularly the Obama administration, but, more in, but increasingly even under the Trump administration. The fact of the matter is that our big question always was, we were always for the Americans when they needed us. Uh, First World War, Second World War, throughout the Cold War, in the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, but will the Americans be there for us if we need them? And of course, that question was raised quite in your face uh, in 2012 during the Scarborough crisis. And the assessment of a lot of people was the United States was not really there for us when we needed them the most. But the fourth factor is that while Americans were ambivalent towards their alliance with us and whether our mutual defense treaty would be applied in an event of conflict in the South China Sea, the Chinese were much more clear about what would await us if we recalibrated, if we had a normalization of ties with them. I think the Chinese have been very clear that if we continued the policies of the previous administration, they will, li they will make life very difficult for us in the Scarborough Shoal, in the South China Sea, and of course, prospects for major Chinese investments, which a lot of times has to do with how the Chinese government decides on how their private sector should approach other countries, those investments will be kept uh, uh, on hold. But if the Philippines recalibrated its foreign policy, adopted a much more friendly and cordial approach, then the Chinese would try to encourage their major companies, state-owned enterprises, uh, to invest in the Philippines. And of course, accordingly, also the Chinese business community will be more aggressive in investing in this country. And the fifth factor is sometimes President Duterte is just a little bit um, unpredictable because he allows his emotions to come in. I'm, I think next to President Donald Trump of the United States, President Duterte uses the words I, me, and myself more than any other leader I have in mind uh, in recent memory. And of course, that introduces some element of unpredictability, but nonetheless, there is some logic, or as some would put it, some method to the madness of President Duterte's foreign policy approach. Nonetheless, of course, very quickly, what is the public opinion in the Philippines? I'll go very quickly through this. I'm not sure what's the relevance here, but the fact of the matter is that the US remains to be the most popular foreign power in the eyes of the majority of the Filipinos, while China is the least favorable country in the eyes of majority of Filipinos. No surprise with that. Of course, we know in 2013, there were more Filipinos who approve of America's role in the world than there were Americans who approve of their own country's role in the world. It was 89 versus 86%. Those high numbers are still there even under the Trump administration. What is surprising is when people were asked 
if the United States is a reliable partner, are they there for us? Have, there, have they been beneficial to us? Half of Filipinos were actually either saying no or they were not sure about it. Well, when people were asked, do you think that we should rather explore a security and defense relationship with China and Russia than the United States? So it's a mutually exclusive question, almost a plurality. 47% of Filipinos were open to the idea or were pondering it. How do you interpret this seemingly contradictory survey? What the surveys show is that majority of Filipinos prefer America as our partner, but a a large number of Filipinos do not see America as a reliable partner, while almost the opposite is true. Uh, a lot of Filipinos may not like China, but they see China and also potentially Russia as beneficial partners. So it's a, what I call the credibility gap. America is favorable, but there is a credibility gap there. This survey came out by the Pew Research Center just a few months ago that showed that in the past two years, since the uh, Duterte administration came into power, the number of Filipinos who want to have stronger economic relationship with China has dramatically increased from 43 to 67%, and the inverse is true. The number of Filipinos who said we have to take a tougher approach towards China, perhaps even sacrificing our economic relationship with them, has also come down. In many ways, you can say that President Duterte's foreign policy is actually convincing majority of people to come on board and be supportive of that. And of course, since President Trump's coming to power, we see a dramatic fall in America's approval ratings here in the Philippines and around the world, while under President Xi Jinping in China, you see a steady increase in American favorability. So the gap between China and United States is also narrowing in terms of their favorability. Now, does this mean that our relationship with the U.S. is done, that we are already entering into a new alliance with China against the U.S.? Not true. Actually, our relationship with the U.S. has been more or less stable. The metaphor I use is like a balloon. So imagine if you press balloon in one side, it bulges out in another place. The places where our alliance with the US has been deflated has to do with what we used to cooperate with Americans that had to do with China. So in particular, during the Aquino administration, we had military exercises with China in the South China Sea, the Fiblex and Karat, that were targeted against China. Those activities, parts of our cooperation with the US that was pointing at China like a dagger President Duterte has taken that out. And even if Duterte and Trump seem to be having a bromance, it doesn't seem that those kinds of cooperation will come back because President Duterte is determined to, to have a normalized relationship with China. The rapprochement with China is going to continue. But aspects of our relationship with US that have nothing to do with China, at least directly, have actually expanded. So ironically, counterterrorism cooperation with the US has never been as good under President Duterte, and unfortunately because of the Marawi crisis, we're even having more expanded counterterrorism cooperation with Americans. And as some of you may know, the American DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, is actually helping the Philippines in counter narcotics, ironically, with respect to some of the narcotic elements being imported from a country called China, or President Duterte's new Beshi. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind is, of course, President Duterte has also been very kind to China. Under the Philippines' chairmanship of the ASEAN, we blocked any criticism of China's activities in the South China Sea. When United States, Australia, and Japan asked us to raise our arbitration award against China, our Foreign Secretary Caetano said, well, it's up to us whether we want to raise it or not. So as I, or as I sarcastically put it, it is our sovereign right whether we want to assert our sovereign right. So it's none of the business of other powers to tell us what to do. Um, now, what is behind all of this rapprochement with China? On one hand, President Duterte wants to avoid conflict, of course, clear. But the other thing is, of course, follow the money. As you know, China offered $24 billion in terms of B2B and P2P uh, uh, kind of uh, investment pledges during President Duterte's visit to China uh, in 2016 October. Uh, when Premier Li Keqiang was here last November, uh, they signed uh, a package of deals worth $7.34 billion. Much of that has to do with infrastructure investment. And of course, Duterte also offered China a possible stake as third major force in Philippine telecommunication. Now, the fact of the matter is that China has completely transformed over the past of uh, 15 years. If you were talking about China in 2001, China was a non-player when it came to outbound investment. Within a matter of 10 years, China went from zero to almost $630 billion in terms of its outbound investments around the world. 
Unfortunately, during this time of peak in Chinese investment around the world, we were not among the beneficiaries of that. The biggest beneficiaries were countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and of course, energy exporting countries like Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria. So for a long time, China has been emerging as a major investor around the world. It's just that the Philippines was not on the radar. Now, over the past five years, China has put forward what they call the New Silk Road Initiative that has two wings. One wing is the continental one, uh, the, the road, uh, the belt, and then the road is the what we also call the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. Interestingly, when China released a map of that through Xinhua News Agency in 2013, the Philippines was not part of the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. As you know, in basic history, we were at the center of galleon trade, and the Ming Dynasty actually was trading with Spain and other major powers through the Philippines. So as I reminded some of our Chinese friends, as far as I know, the Philippines was part of the ancient Maritime Silk Road, so how come we're not part of that? Now, Amid improving relations with China, it seems that that map is getting adjusted and the Philippines is being connected to that. So investing in the Philippines is not only about China's good relationship with President Duterte, it's also part of China's emergence as a major investor around the world because China is ironically emerging as the new guardian of globalization. So ironically, if you look at it, President Trump of US is talking about protectionism, talking about fair trade, talking against globalization, while President Xi Jinping talks about open trade, multilateralism, and investing around the world and pushing the agenda of globalization forward. Nonetheless, what are the key concerns with Chinese investments in, in Philippines based on our history and around the world? Of course, the first concern is security. In the case of the United States and in Germany recently, some of the investments by China were blocked because they were perceived to be in critical sectors like telecommunication, electricity, and critical infrastructure. A Chinese uh, company has actually a stake in our national grid. Uh, nonetheless, some people are saying if the Chinese get involved in our telecommunication sector, that could raise concerns with national security because after all, we're just normalizing our relations with China, but still we have significant security concerns with China, particularly in the South China Sea. The second factor is bidding and competitiveness. One of the concerns we have is when the Chinese companies get involved in projects here in the Philippines, will they respect the bidding procedures? We know that in the case of North Railway Project, under the Arroyo administration, there was a violation of the bidding procedure by a Chinese company, thus the Supreme Court struck that down. Now, will China have a much more competitive package whereby there is a bidding among different Chinese companies before they gain those projects? That's the question we have to answer. The third issue is, of course, corruption and good governance. That was very clear in the case of NBNZTE. Of course, also respect for uh, environmental sustainability and other kind of important indicators of good governance. The fourth factor is, for me, this could be a big issue. China tends to bring its own laborers. So in places like Laos, for instance, a small village, a small Lao village, had to accommodate 100,000 Chinese workers because the Chinese wanted to build a railway there. Now that's gonna be a big issue in a country like the Philippines whereby you have a lot of unskilled or semi-skilled labor who could actually be involved in infrastructure projects. Our hope is that the Duterteonomics build, build, build projects will create jobs. But if the jobs are gonna go primarily to the Chinese, not only in terms of management, not only in terms of engineering, but also in terms of low-skilled labor, I can imagine that that will be very negatively covered by the Philippine media, and also the reception will not be positive. And lastly is the issue of costs, quality, and durability. We know that, for instance, in Indonesia, when the Chinese bidded for a major high-speed railway project between Jakarta and Bandung, the price was so low, there was no way that the Japanese could compete with it. But the problem is that what is offered during the bidding is not necessarily what happens when the project starts. Sometimes the cost overruns are significant. So it's important that our government, when we are welcoming investments by China, we take into consideration the fact that the final cost could be very different from the costs that were put forward during the bidding procedures. And also look at all of those key factors that we have to keep in mind. Now, this doesn't say that we should not welcome Chinese investments. It's just saying that we have to welcome it, but with a little bit of caution and benefit of hindsight. As Reagan said, trust but verify. Okay, now what are the facts on the ground? If you look at media coverage here and around the world, the talk is as if China is gonna be the next major investor in the Philippines, the Philippines is gonna be the next colony of China, so on and so forth. We're gonna be Sri Lanka, there's gonna be a debt trap. I think all of that is pure nonsense. Uh, first of all, if you look at facts on the ground, China is well behind other major countries when it comes to investments. Uh, countries like Japan and United States, their share of FDI stock in the Philippines is beyond 10%, while China is barely in the 1% territory. 
uh, actually South Korean and American investments have suffered major reversal over the past year here in the Philippines. 92% uh, drop in South Korean investment in the Philippines, according to the BOI, PESA. Uh, American investment actually went down close to 70%, but there was a jump in Chinese investment by 15%, though the number is very small. Just compare the numbers of American investment in the Philippines and Chinese investment, you could see how small the Chinese imprint in the Philippines still is. But the other surprisingly good story is that Japan's investment in the Philippines is increasing by almost 24%. And just look at how huge the Chinese investment in the Philippines is. It's around $25 billion, uh, pesos, I'm sorry. And we know that major projects such as the underground metro system here in Manila will most likely be built by the Japanese. So Japan continues to lead the way, and China is slowly coming uh, forward as a major investor in the Philippines. Now, a uh, good friend of mine uh, uh, from Ateneo School of Government, Dean Ronald Mendoza, also came up with an interesting uh, analysis. His concern was that we are already very dependent on China for importation of a lot of critical uh, elements such as steel and minerals. Uh, and China's already our top source for a lot of that. The concern is that if the build, build, build projects move forward, there could be a 10 to 12 times or 12 fold increase in the imports of those materials. So we will be even more dependent on China for imports of critical materials that we need in order to build up our infrastructure. So it seems that the Tonomics build, build, build project is moving forward, but we have to be also uh, uh, keep in mind that that also means more dependence on foreign countries like China for the importation of intermediate and basic goods. Now, nonetheless, does that mean that we're going to rely on China or foreign powers uh, to boost and fuel and fund our build, build, build dotertonomics projects? Not necessarily. If you look at the, uh, the data that came out uh, from uh, Secretary Jokno, actually only 15% of the expenditure for the build, build, build project will come from overseas development assistance. And only a small part of that 15% will come from a country like China. So we're not going to be over-dependent on China in terms of financial financing of our infrastructure projects. It's more dependence on China in terms of intermediate goods and basic materials. And that's why passing the train was very important. We need to get our fiscal house in order so that we can fund our own infrastructure build up in this country because the GAA or General Appropriations of the Philippines will be the majority source for funding the Duterteonomics uh, build, build, build agenda. Now, is our foreign policy towards China irreversible? Is China gonna be our ne next Beshi? Is this kind of rapprochement and flirtation with China going to continue? Well, not necessarily. This relationship is still in the air. We have a lot of concerns with China's activities in the South China Sea. Maybe President Duterte or Foreign Secretary Caetano, they have a lot of positive things to say about China. Sometimes they dismiss the Chinese threat in the South China Sea. But if you look at statements by people like Secretary Lorenzana of the Department of Defense, people in the military, people in the media in the Philippines, and of course in the opposition, they continue to raise concerns over China's activities in the South China Sea. In my opinion, if the Chinese build infrastructure in the Scarborough Shoal, if they move forward with creating a so-called strategic triangle among Spratly's Paracels and Scarborough Shoal, that could create a huge problem for President Duterte's uh, rapprochement uh, with, uh, with, with China. There are other factors that we have to keep in mind in terms of how Philippines and China are gonna move forward. My basic argument is that that relationship is uh, very much uh, a fluid one. Today, we are getting better and better with China, while our relationship with America is no longer as special as before, but there are a number of factors that can change that. Nonetheless, of course, the other reality, as I've been writing for Washington Post and other major articles, is that America doesn't seem to be also a very reliable partner. Uh, so in a way, our attraction to China is also a reflection of our, our growing skepticism about where America is gonna go. Okay, so I'll keep it there because I wanted to uh, keep more time for the question and answer portion. Thank you very much for giving your uh, this opportunity and I look forward if there are any questions or anything like that. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Haydar. And again, if you have any questions, guys, uh, please feel free to approach the mics and uh, f um, engage with the professor directly. Right. Sir, sit down. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to start, no? So, of course, uh, we took a short survey of our customers, which I will discuss later, about how bullish they are about 2018. Now, given this, given the developments in China, is this response merited for our investors? They're bullish. Now, is this one of the reasons 
Or should this be one of the reasons why they should be bullish? Well, I think they're, as I said, uh, the picture is quite mixed. I mm -hmm. mean, investments from South Korea and America seem to be either, I mean, this new investment. No, it's not like Americans are pulling out or anything like that, but new investments are not coming on. So certain sectors like BPO, for instance, right. it seems the reason for being bullishness is not much there, right? right. So there are certain yeah. sectors that are not going to do good. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Japanese and Chinese are getting involved in other sectors, like basic infrastructure. Uh, so I think those sectors, we could be more bullish about that. So if you're investing in a portfolio that has to do something with where Chinese and, 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 and Japanese money is coming in, right, right. then you definitely have a reason to be bullish. Right. But overall, uh, you talk to any economist, you look at the data, it seems that the Philippines has been structurally locked mm -hmm. into a high growth uh, kind yes, that's of correct. cycle. Uh -huh. So I expect the Philippines to grow at six to seven percent over the next three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is not only because of the efforts of the Duterte administration. We know that this is what you call macroeconomic inertia. Right. All of this is product in one way or another of, of course, Population. positive uh, environment externally, but also the fact that Arroyo administration and Aquino administration actually laid down the foundation of macroeconomic stability mm -hmm. that we're enjoying today. So the challenge for President Duterte is to make sure that we go from a semi-low quality high growth mm -hmm. to a much more high quality high growth. Right, because we right. have had low quality high growth. And why do you say low quality high growth? Because the kind of growth we have had has not been in inclusive in terms of dealing with underemployment issues, dealing with poverty issues. And actually, if you look at our Gini coefficient or inequality in this country, it has not improved. Right. So in the World Bank data, for instance, it showed that the Philippines has the highest concentration of growth in Asia. Right. Uh, 40 biggest families in this country took home 76% of newly created growth. So from that 6 to 7%, 4.5% to right. 5% went to only 40 families. That's just unbelievable. Now, right. I'm glad that at least you have a new emerging middle class in the Philippines that is more financially literate, mm -hmm. is trying to get involved in the market, and I hope this segment will get more uh, advantage of what's happening in this country. So the challenge for the Duterte administration is bring in more greenfield investments. Mm -hmm. So I think the greenfield investment is gonna be a challenge, right. but once we get the infrastructure issue right, we introduce more uh, regulatory certainty, mm -hmm. uh, and we deal with concerns like corruption, among other things in this country, then I expect more greenfield investments will come into this country. And that, accordingly, I think will have a multiplier effect and positive effect over the economy. So overall, I'm bullish, but there are certain sectors that are not doing as well as they should have mm -hmm. done. And President Duterte's rhetoric has indeed have some negative impact on mm -hmm. the sentiment of some investment community, particularly in the West. Right. That's just a fact that I have confirmed based on my own conversation when I've been in these countries. But Japan and China so far are doing well, and I think those two countries have a lot of resources to offer. Right, so when we open the doors for China, of course, you, as, as you have mentioned, although the results may be mixed, but the general impression is that it's going to be better for us, right? Because there will be an open flow of investments from China. So, as uh, I think I caught a bit of your presentation a while ago, that this relationship still remains to be, uh, uh, shall I say, up in the air. So, meaning that it's not yet definite. So, what are the situations wherein we expect this to be derailed? Well, I mean, again, I don't want to be a complete skeptic or KJ <laughs> here, but right. uh, the reality is that if you look at the data, there tends to be a 10 to 1 ratio. That's the worst case, or five to one ratio. In short, for every 10 billion that China offers, you can only expect one billion to come in. Okay. If you're a little bit luckier, two billion comes right. in. So when China says, I'm offering 24 billion, I'm looking around two to More three billion dollars. Three billion. That's yes. what I have in mind. Most optimistically, five to six billion. That's still a lot of money. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Chinese money alone is gonna sa sa save this country. So it's important that the Duterte administration has a kind of economic and foreign policy that appeals to the broadest range of investment investors as possible. Uh, because we need as much investment as possible to overhaul our economy. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that when it comes to China, they don't operate like the Americans or uh, other major powers. Because in other major powers, like the Americans for instance, the government cannot tell the private sector to invest in country A, B, and C. So Trump cannot tell although Trump claims a lot of things, right. but he cannot tell the GE or Silicon Valley right. to come in the Philippines. In China, Xi Jinping can more yeah. or less do that. <laughs> he can say to it's Alibaba yeah. and Huawei yes. and ZTE and other major companies to come in. Because a lot of these companies are either, there's a direct state 
control there, mm -hmm. or the state has some sort of control over them through some offering influence. incentives that they can withdraw. Right. So in China, you have what they call state capitalism, mm -hmm. right? So if our political relationship with China keeps on improving, you can expect the Chinese government to push more and more of their state-owned enterprises to be involved in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Now, what is of more relevance to our audience perhaps here is that, what about the private sector in China? Mm -hmm. uh, and my sense is that if the political environment improves, and the Chinese government gives the go-ahead signal, and this rapprochement gains more stability and crystallization, I think the Chinese private investment will also come in. So mm -hmm. far, I mean, under the Aquino administration, for instance, there was a lot of Chinese investment. But there were investment in sectors like, I mean, casino uh, mm -hmm. or in extractive industries. Right, right. What we're hoping is more high quality Chinese investments coming to the Philippines. I was just in Vietnam the other week. And if you're aware about Vietnam, yes, Vietnam and China have bad relationship right. in a lot of ways. But there is enough political stability for the Chinese to come in. And you see more and more Chinese companies, textile companies, mm -hmm. low to medium manufacturing are already moving to Vietnam. Right. There are also hopes that the Chinese you know, manufacturing will also move across Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. Philippines and Indonesia could be the next target. So this is not only about Chinese infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. This could be also about Chinese investment private in general, investment. Right. both private sector, both public sector, also in hard infrastructure, also in soft infrastructure, mm -hmm. and also in manufacturing and the services. So there's a whole range of Chinese investments that we can look at. Uh, and I think that's why it's important this political uh, kind of rapprochement with China will continue. But I hope also that the Chinese government doesn't expect that just because they're investing in the Philippines, suddenly we're gonna go soft on other issues like right. South China Sea, our claims mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. or suddenly we're gonna abandon our relations with America. Right. Uh, as I call it, it's called equilateral balancing. Right. You can have a situation whereby you have good relationship with all major powers and you use and you use one major power and play him against the other major powers. This is what South Korea, Malaysia, Vietnam, all of these smaller countries have been doing. Mm -hmm. So President Duterte, in, in that sense, is not unique. He's just doing no. what other smaller countries have been doing towards the U.S. and China. Right. All right. Again, if you have any questions for Professor Heydarian, please approach the mics if you uh, want to engage with him directly. It's a one and only chance, a unique chance to engage with the... Uh... Yes, sir. Go ahead. Please. Push the mics. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for that very intuitive uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, is six years actually enough or sufficient to sustain the shift that's ongoing? I mean, with uh, uh, powers being rebalanced uh, after six years uh, of the admini current administration, uh, do you think there is a chance for this shift to sustain itself and indeed be beneficial in the long run for the Philippine economics. Thank you. Well, I mean, as, as I always say, um, there's now a discussion about cha-cha, right? And, and a shift to a federal parliamentary system. I am skeptical about that for certain reasons, but at the same time, uh, we know that the problem with the 1987 constitution was it was very reactionary. It was a reaction just to the Marcos dictatorship or hero, whatever Marcos is today. Um, uh, so in that way, it that did not anticipate the needs of our country in the 21st century, uh, among other things, restrictions on foreign uh, investments and foreign ownership uh, in the economy. But one major problem I have with the 1997 Constitution is the six years single term. Because for me, six years is too long if you have a bad president. Because it's very hard to impeach presidents in this country. Both ETSA 1 and ETSA 2 are what technically are called civilian back coups. If not for the AFP, Marcos and Estrada would not have stepped down from power. It was when the AFP, it was when they withdrew their support that they had to step down. So the whole people power thing was fundamentally a coup that was supported by protest on the ground. So you cannot get bad presidents impeached, assuming Estrada and Marcos were bad. But six years is too short if you have a good president. That's the problem. What I always believed is a re-election, four to four years or five to five years, because in that situation, if you have a re-election, the president has all the incentive to do well in his first year so that he gets re-elected, while in the second term, because he no longer needs to get re-elected, he can focus on his legacy. So in the case of President Obama, if you've noticed, it was in his seventh year that a lot of his legacy legislations came into being because the Supreme Court in China approved the LGBT issue, uh, the Obamacare issue, so on and so forth. So sometimes, uh, you know, you need up to seven, eight years for things to come into fruition. Uh, because there's a lag time. The other problem that the six years term creates is that 
Always the succeeding administration takes the credit for what the previous administration did. Aquino did that to Arroyo very unfairly in terms of the economic, macroeconomic uh, uh, legacy of uh, President Arroyo. And uh, Duterte now is going to take the credit for a lot of things that Aquino did, right? So six years, I think, is a very artificially uh, small number of years, uh, limited number of years that you can give to a good leader. Now, when it comes to Duterte economics, I'm very sure that you know, a lot of those projects will not finish under President Duterte. They themselves are quite honest about this. But even if we just get 50% of their plans done by the end of the Duterte administration, that's going to be a huge leap from the previous administration. Because this administration is very focused on infrastructure, right? I may have concerns with human rights, so on and so forth. This is not the right venue for that. But when it comes to economic policy, this administration is doing the right thing, and President Duterte is using his political capital to get the kind of legislative reforms that we need in this country. So in that sense, I'm actually bullish, economically speaking, on this administration, even compared to some of the previous administrations. Now, I hope that there will be continuity. It doesn't have to be Sara Duterte for there to be a continuity, right? It's important that there will be enough institutional reforms, but at the same time, also in terms of political discourse push for whoever becomes the next president. It could be from the opposition, it could be friend of President Duterte, who knows, it could be the Marcuses, that they will continue what this administration started. So gladly President Duterte continued the macroeconomic reforms of Arroyo and Aquino, in terms of keeping inflation low, keeping our trade deficit low, so do we see continuity. Let's be fair to our, our past three presidents have had good continuity. They hope, hopefully, the next level of continuity will, inter will be in terms of focusing on infrastructure development and bringing in greenfield investments. And if we do that, then, then who knows? And the other thing we have to keep in mind is that it seems now, psychologically, time is more compressed, right? So, but it's, it's also more intense, right? Like, f I think the Filipino political mindset is changing very fast, and that has to do with the fact that our political discourse also is now much more vibrant. Now, I hope that means that in six years, we'll be able to also really reform our national mindset on what it means to really be a prosperous country. Because I think in the past, we had a very shallow understanding of prosperity, essentially high GDP growth rates. We have to go beyond those simplistic indicators and look at really facts on the ground. And I think that's what I hope we'll have more maturity and appreciation of, of in the coming years. Thank you. All right, I, I think we have a, another question from the last row. Uh, given that uh, yes. there's a decline in, uh, in terms yep. of actual value in investments from, for example, Korea and the U.S., and although there's an increase in, from China and Japan investment, the actual absolute value is still very low compared to the loss. Maybe we haven't felt it now because the effect from previous years from this uh, high investment is still uh, felt now but in the in, say in a couple of years do you think that the loss in investment from the other countries china will make up for in terms of absolute value i'm not talking about percentage just the first question the second question is what is your take that the philippines or the president is offering joint exploration rights with China for Benham Rice, an area which n never under dispute between the Philippines and China. Yes, I agree with maybe hesitantly with the Spratlys because that's an area under dispute, but Benham Rice is ours. So why are we offering joint exploratory rights or research rights with China? Now it's becoming very political. Okay. <laughs> We got to know during the budget deliberations last year that there was a 90% drop in new incoming investments uh, from middle of 2016 to middle of 2017. That, that was quite a scandalous wake up. So you had even folks in the NEDA, like Professor Pernia, who had to kind of acknowledge it. The fact of the matter is that what some people here call political noise is seen differently abroad. Abroad, there is huge concern about rule of law in this country. Because rule of law means that things are not done extrajudicially. Things are not done unpredictably. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that on one hand, if you look at our credit rating, it has either improved or it's stable. If you look at our GDP growth rates, we are meeting our targets. Inflation is a little bit picking up, but it's still good enough. So on one hand, it seems things are not that bad. But on the other hand, if you look at new income investments, there has been a kind of major blip. So that should have been a wake-up call for this administration to make sure that they put on certain kinds of policies that reassures the investment community. And as I said, if you look at the Chinese 
investments in the Philippines is negligible compared to the Japanese or the Americans. Uh, so there's no way that China alone, right, unless they put suddenly $200 billion in the Philippines, which I doubt they're going to do that, will make up in absolute terms for whatever is not coming from the West. A smart foreign policy will bring in investment from a whole range of investors around the world. I, for a fact, know that the Europeans were hoping to send a major delegation to the Philippines towards the end of the Aquino administration. The plan was for the successor. And then all the, <laughs> let's not go there, <laughs> things happened, uh, <laughs> and uh, they got turned off. They got turned off. And we cannot, sure, the West is not as powerful as before, but the fact of the matter is that the Wall Streets of the world are still in the West. The West still controls the IMF and the World Bank. The West is still reigning supreme. And the West still has a lot of technology that China doesn't have. The same thing with Japan, right? So I think, on one hand, it's a good thing that President Duterte is improving our relationship with China and we're getting more money from China, but I think it's a total illusion to think that China alone can compensate for whatever loss we could suffer for the other major powers. A smart policy is to bring all of them in. Now, our hope is that that 90% drop is a temporary knee-jerk reaction to some of the negative press coverage in the Philippines and negative things that really happen on the ground, right? Let's not just blame press coverage. Certain negative things happen on the ground. But the thing is, a lot of investors around the world were looking at whether President Duterte can go beyond just drugs, drugs, drugs and talk about economics, build, build, build. And I think the passage of the train, we, ha we have some problems with, with the final law, sure, but the passage of the train was a very good signal to the international community that President Duterte has also other agendas, that Duterte administration is not only about drugs, it's not only about anti-American, anti-Western rhetoric, that there's more to this administration that, that, than you think. So I won't be surprised if in the coming years some of that reversals actually will be corrected, coming from the Americans and coming from the West, assuming if President Duterte doesn't return back to his behavior in the first six months to one year in office and hopefully not bring back the Tokang operations and everything like that. So those things unfortunately have affected us and we cannot deny those facts. On the other hand, Japan is a major investor in the Philippines and the investment from J Japan are huge and those investments keep on expanding. This is where President Duterte's China policy has actually been helpful because I know one reason the Japanese are investing in the Philippines is because they're competing with China and they don't want China to be a major investor here. So it seems our reaching out to China hurt in one way or another uh, our relations with the West, but it actually encouraged Japan to invest more in the Philippines. That's why it's a mixed picture. So if I take a snapshot of the Philippine foreign policy today, for me it's largely defensible, but the picture is fluid, so in the coming years, it, our relations with China could change, but it, my hunch is, if you're gonna force me to predict this, my hunch is that Ch China's gonna invest in the Philippines, but you're only talking about a few billions of dollars, and if President Duterte continues to normalize, whatever you can call that, <laughs> and kind of tames his rhetoric, some of those investments that were gone, they're gonna come back, especially from America and from the West. Uh, and if, especially if we deal with the infrastructure issue. The last thing is on the Benham rise, we're not doing joint development with them. What we're doing is that we're giving a Chinese institute a maritime scientific research license. What's controversial to me is that the French institute was denied that, while the Chinese were allowed that. I need to know more about the circumstances of that. And the other thing we have to keep in mind is that why China, when they applied for MSR in Benham Rise in 2014 and 15, they were not open to a Filipino scientist joining them. But this year, suddenly, they are open to that. So there should be an explanation why China changed their ideas. Now, I'm okay with maritime scientific research as long as this does not violate our sovereignty or security concerns in the area. And also, I hope that, uh, you know, in short, I'm okay with confidence building measures with China. But again, as Reagan said, trust but verify. We have to be very cautious about that. Let's not be overexcited to have a good relationship with China. China should show us goodwill. It's not us. It's not our responsibility. It's their responsibility to do that. But unfortunately, it seems sometimes our government is more eager to show gesture of goodwill to China than the other way around. So it remains to be seen where this relationship is going to go. Thank you very much. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now for Professor Hidarin. Again, thank you very much, sir, for sharing your uh, information with us.